Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our heavenly Savior, Jesus the Christ, in whom we find the true meaning of love. Uh, my friends, I was, as I prepared for this message this week, I came across this old story. And apparently, as the story goes, apparently um, one night the ship captain was out on the water, and as he looked out into the darkness, he saw these lights faintly blinking out in the distance. And so the captain, when he saw these lights, he immediately told his signalman to send out this message, which said, alter your course 10 degrees south. Well, almost immediately the message came back, alter your course 10 degrees north. Well, apparently this captain did not really appreciate the response indicating that his command was being ignored. And so again, he went and sent out another command, alter your 10 degrees south, I and the captain. There were, again, there were, almost immediately the response came back, and this time it said, alter your course 10 degrees north, I am seaman third class Jones. Well, almost, again, all, almost immediately the ma captain was teed off when he heard this. He did not appreciate his orders being ignored. And so he sent out a third message, this time thinking it would strike fear into the hearts of those of the person who was hearing it. He said, alter your course 10 degrees south, I am a battleship. The response that came back was, alter your course 10 degrees north, I am a lighthouse. <laughs> I thought oh, maybe some of the Navy people here would appreciate that. But it's interesting how so often people like to believe that they are the ones are in control. And I don't believe that is restricted to a select few. I think so many of us like to think that we are the ones in control. And I'll have to admit that I used to be one of those people who thought I was in control of all, of all things. When I worked retail, I got a big ego because I got promoted to management within three months because I could get things done in the store. I had an illusion of control. I all, some of you know that I worked in the music industry prior to hearing God's call. When I would go out and DJ, I knew playing certain songs would get people to stop what they were doing and pack the dance floor. I knew how to keep them there. I had the illusion of control. When I worked as a wine salesman, I knew how to get people to pick that bottle off the shelf and take it to the counter, pro promising that they would come back to buy more bottles. I had the illusion of control. And then something happened. I heard God calling me to come and serve him in the church as one of his shepherds. And let me tell you something that I've learned. I am not the one in control here. To be a faithful servant of God, not just up front, but to be a faithful servant of Christ in whatever part of our lives, you have to admit that you are not the one in control. And if God is your co-pilot, you need to switch seats. But we don't like to admit that, do we? We don't like letting go of the steering wheel. We like to think that we are the one that is driving the battleship and that everyone else needs to get out of our way. We like to tell people that all we really need is you, that all we need is ourselves. And truth be told, though, nothing could be further from the truth. But if we look to our text from Mark this morning, Mark chapter 9, we find Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they're all coming down the mountain. Prior to this, they had gone up to what we know as the transfiguration. And when Jesus went up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, Jesus' clothes get changed into radiant white, whiter than all things in all creation. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah had appeared up on the mountain with him, and Jesus was having some quiet time with them. And then when all this changes, when Elijah and Moses disappear, Jesus' clothes go back being the way they were before the transfiguration they go down the mountain and Jesus, Peter, James and John they come down the mountain and what we see there is the scene playing out in front of them with the disciples in the midst of this heated argument with some of the temple scribes 
And we soon find out that there has just been this certain man who brought his son to the, there to be healed by Jesus, to cast out the demon that has been in him from childhood. And yet Jesus was up on the mountain when the man got there with his son. And so he figured he would do the next best thing, use his disciples, ask his disciples to perform this exorcism, which is bizarre to say, at least for a pastor, to say that there's something that even could fill the second chair for Jesus. And yet, as we, as we find out, and we shouldn't be surprised to find out, the disciples, they couldn't do it. It's not that they wouldn't do it, it's that they couldn't do it. And we'll find out soon why they couldn't. But listen how Jesus responds when he hears this. This is Mark chapter 9, verse 19. He says, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? And I know it sounds like Jesus is getting exasperated with the disciples and the crowd there. Like It almost sounds like he's, he's about to be done with everybody and everything and just to call it quits. And yet, we need to, spend, uh, to pay special attention here. What were those first three words that Jesus just said? Oh, faithless generation. And those three words are the key here. Oh, faithless generation. Well, after this, the demon-possessed boy is brought to Jesus. And as soon as the demon sees Jesus, it recognizes him. It knows who is before him. It knows, this demon knows that it is in the very presence of God himself. The demon knows what God can do to him. It knows that its, the, that its days are numbered. In fact, if you go to the book of James, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, it tells us this. It says, even the demons believe and shudder. Even the demons believe and shudder. See, the fact is that even though the demons and the devil himself don't follow God, they recognize his authority. They recognize his power. They know that there is nothing that they can do against God. And they recognize him, which is odd if you think about it, because so many of us, don't recognize God's authority, do we? We don't recognize his power. And it's why I believe it's one of the greatest lies that Satan ever told was that he doesn't exist. Because if Satan doesn't exist, why should I believe that God exists? If Satan doesn't exist, why should I recognize God's authority and power? But let's jump back into Mark. So if we go into Mark, this demon sees Jesus. Jesus, God the Son, standing right there in front of him. And he knows he's in for it. And so he takes this boy and he throws him to the ground. He makes him roll back and forth, foaming at the mouth. And then we hear these words, like in Mark 9, verse 21. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the boy's father says, from childhood. I just feel that in my heart. It's been happening to him since he was a little tiny boy. And the father goes on, and it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. Again, I feel this father's heart being crushed. Watching this boy being beaten up and feeling powerless wanting to be able to do something to stop this demon from torturing his son, and he can't do it. And here's where it gets a little bit more serious. The boy's father says this. He says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Would anybody say that it's safe, probably a safe bet to, that this father doesn't realize who's standing before him? I think I would. He does, the father doesn't really grasp who he's speaking to, that he doesn't really grasp the who is in front of him, that God, the Son, is truly before him. And unfortunately, I think that sometimes we probably, more often than we'd like to admit, that we forget when we come, even when we come to church, who we are coming before. 
I believe that we forget about the authority and power of our God, just how big he truly is. We forget who we're praying to sometimes. Think about if we truly thought about the word of God and how that word speaks about Jesus, about God the Father, about the Holy Spirit. If we took those words seriously, how that would change our worship. The power of God. And this goes back to our illusion of control. We like to think that we are the ones in charge. Now, again, on a personal note, my guess is that most of you probably know about the struggle that my youngest son, Nathan, has been going through. My son, Nathan, who has a tumor in his brain, an inoperable tumor. Um, And this has been going on before. We've been dealing with this before we even came here. But in no other time in my life have I ever felt so utterly helpless. No other time in my life have I ever felt that I am completely powerless in this situation. And I say this as someone who is a firm believer that it is biblical to, for, a, for a father and a husband to have to protect, to be responsible for protecting their family. And yet, as I came into the situation with Nathan, what I came to understand is that the only power I have is to fall on my hands and knees and my face before my God and pray to him for the safety of my son. To pray for the skill and wisdom of his doctors and his nurses. Because truth be told, there is no safer place than to be in my heavenly father's arms, than for my son to be in our heavenly father's arms. Can I have an amen? Amen. Quite frankly, though, as we, we, that's why what happens next in Mark is so amazing. Okay, so Mark 9, starting at verse 23, we hear this, and Jesus said to him, if you can, responding to this father who made that comment, he says next, all things are possible for one who Grace. Yes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my I love that prayer. And I can call it a prayer because who this man is addressing. He is talking to God the Son, Jesus the Christ, standing right before him. I believe, help my unbelief. Because this man is acknowledging that Jesus as Lord, as Lord in those very words. And he's also acknowledging his struggle with his faith, isn't he? I believe, Lord, and yet I'm struggling with my faith and help me with that struggle. And we're going to come back to that in a second. But Jesus, he casts out the demon and makes sure that it can never return. Later, when Jesus and his disciples are alone, the crowds are nowhere inside. And they ask Jesus, why couldn't we cast out this demon? My guess is they're asked this question because what happened way back in Mark chapter 6, where Jesus had sent his disciples out two by two on these short missionary trips where they were preaching and teaching and casting out demons and healing the sick. In fact, I love the the extra detail that Luke adds to it in his gospel. Luke chapter 10, verse 17, we hear the disciples telling Jesus when they come back, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. In the name of Christ, they are subject to him. And I want to contrast That was Jesus' answer to his disciples as to why they couldn't cast out the demons. In Mark 9, 29, we hear Jesus tell his disciples, and he said to them, This kind cannot be driven driven out by anything but... What had the disciples forgotten to do? Pray. And when you pray, who are you talking to? Hopefully. God. So who had the disciples left out of this? Yeah. Can that again to me this as I think about it almost sounds comical. To try and cast out a demon, to try and exercise a demon without bringing it before God. This really it, it should sound comical to us. It should sound ridiculous to us. <coughs> Excuse me. 
But why, again, why couldn't we cast this out? Well, I know I love there's this nether aunt to me. It's, again, it's almost comical the more I look at it. Comical and sad at the same time. In Acts chapter 19, most Bibles call this, portion, this one section as the sons of Sceva. Anybody hear of that? Well, in Acts chapter 19, uh, starting at verse 13, it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Stop and think about that. They're trying to cast out a demon by saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Are you kidding me? It goes on, verse 14, seven sons of, of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil priest answered, well, but the, sorry, the evil spirits answered them saying, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit left on them, mastered all of them, overpowered them, that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. They weren't even talking to God, asking him to come and remove the demon. They thought, hey, we just used the magic words. We're going to get him to, this demon to come out. They weren't actually asking God to do this, were they? They thought they could just use some magic phrase. You see, the truth is that we are called as Christians, one who bear the name of Christ, that we are called to live by faith and by not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The truth is that we are justified, we are made right before God by faith in Jesus Christ and not by our attempts to be good. That's Galatians 2, 16. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews eleven six. See, the fact is that we have to have the faith. God has to be a part of our lives. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Every time we need Christ in all parts of our lives. And love that somehow, how God works things out like this. And I don't, I don't believe in accidents, how we are going to be blessing both the school teachers here and the Sunday schools in a little bit, the Sunday school teacher in a little bit. Because... No matter whether it's a day school or it's a Sunday school, we need Jesus to be a part of that. I believe that Jesus, the one who died for our sins on the third day, rose from the dead, defeating sin, death, and the devil for you, that we need to serve him, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. And how huge is that? That he wants to be with you there all of the time. See, this faith is placed in the one who gave up his life for you. It's in the, the see, those, for those of us in the faith, it's about living that faith 24-7. 168 hours a week, 365 days a year, or 366 if it's a leap year. We are called to live by faith. With the cookout we have for the community next Saturday, what would it be like if we didn't bother to ask God to be a part of that? What would it be like, this faith, if the only time we worshipped our faith, when we worshipped God, was on this hour block on Sundays? All of us have a vocation. Teachers, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, children, each of us have a vocation. And we need to invite God into that vocation, whether it is raising a child, whether it is going out to the shipyard, whether it is being a stay-at-home mom. All of these are vocations, and we need God so desperately. And yet God wants to be a part of that for you. That is the God we serve. Not a burden, but a blessing to each of you. And I pray that it continues to be a blessing to you for the rest of your days. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. We pray this to God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of his children prayed and said, Amen.